Hello everybody, uh, my name is Derek Arden. Thank you for joining the uh, live chat show. Today I'm delighted to have Graham Davis with me. Graham uh, is a barrister, Graham is a after dinner speaker, and Graham more importantly is a presentations coach and a speech writer. And he writes for some of the most famous politicians in the UK at the moment. And when you look at his website, you will see who some of those people are. And I'm gonna take a chance and try and quiz Graham on some of those and see what secrets he's prepared to share with us. Graham, welcome, thanks so much for joining us. Tremendous to be here, Derek. Graham, before we get into the serious business, everybody has to present, everybody has to make presentations, even if it's only to their partner, to their children, etc. What would be your three basic top tips for persuading people when they're presenting? I think presentation is an activity which always can be boiled down to two phases. Phase number one, deciding what to say. Phase number two, saying it. But I can give you three overall micro tactics that possibly give you a way of looking at the challenge. Number one, decide exactly what you want the audience to know, think or feel after you finish the presentation and then write it down. Write that finishing position, as I call it, down on a piece of paper in one or two sentences so that you never lose sight of it. The finishing position is what you're aiming at. Secondly, then consider all the material that you might need to persuade the audience to get to that finishing position. And I encourage you to write out your material in full, not just in notes, not just headings, not just bullet points, but in full English sentences. And then thirdly, I suggest that no matter how important, how short, or how long the presentation is, you rehearse it as often as you can. And it's only by a process of rehearsal that you can maximize the chance of making a persuasive impact on the audience that you intend. I've got a feeling that most people don't rehearse. Would that be your... I think that's right, because let's face it, whether you are a speaker, that is a professional speaker is speaking a hundred times a year or an occasional presenter who might speak three or four times a year. Rehearsal is about as enjoyable as going to the dentist. It really is never going to be something that people are going to relish and look forward to, but it is a piece of pain you've got to go through in order to maximize your performance in front of the audience that you really want to impress. No, I hadn't heard that uh, metaphor about the dentist and uh, I'm not sure I like that one at all, but I get it uh, totally. Now, you've got a fabulous website and I've been going through the website and there's a few politicians on there. And um, I was um, looking at um, our ex-Prime Minister, Mrs May. Now, um, what was that all about? And that hashtag, I've even forgotten what the hashtag was called, Throatgate. What was that? Well, she did a speech at Conservative Party conference three years ago when she had two major disasters to deal with. Number one, somebody actually got up from the third row of the audience and tried to give her a piece of paper known as a P45 in, in the United Kingdom, which is the document that you give to somebody when you're firing them from their job. It was a very highly calculated spoof and he managed to bluff his way past the security guards on the front of the stage. It was a very tense moment. She responded actually quite cleverly to it. She came out with a reasonably adequate, moderately funny one-liner and got a huge round of applause for it as he was led away by the security guards. So catastrophe number one was averted, but then catastrophe number two hit. And she suddenly started getting a frog in her throat. And it was a frog that kept on erupting into quite a bad cough and then getting worse. She took a couple of small sips of water. And then another senior British cabinet minister, Philip Hammond, actually got up from the third row and offered her a cough sweet, which she started to suck. And of course, that was a huge mistake because you can either do a speech or suck a cough sweet. 
You can't do both at the same time. And things got worse and worse and worse. And hence it being one of the great political disasters of all time. And that's why I call it Throatgate. Oh, so it's you that put the hashtag. Oh, indeed. So. Yeah, well, I thought you would because you're very, very, very funny. Um, so while we're talking about politicians, what about Boris? Can you share anything about Boris with us? Well, Boris and I were direct contemporaries at university. Uh, he was president of the Oxford Union just after I was president of the Cambridge Union. And we haven't, um, <clears throat> we haven't always hit it off on a personal basis. So do bear that in mind in, in, in the colour of the statements I come out with. He was originally, I suppose, up to about a year ago, always perceived as a, as a brilliant speaker. Somebody who could always be brilliantly entertaining, no matter what the circumstances were. But his great strength as a speaker is indeed that he's an entertainer over short periods of time. If you want a 10 minute after dinner speech or five minutes just before your new office is being opened or a three minute jolly interview with, uh, with somebody like Graham Norton or somebody to appear as a panelist on a game show, he's absolutely brilliant. But when he's doing a long political speech, say at party conference, when he's, or when he's being cross-examined under pressure in a political debate during a general election campaign, or being interviewed on a one-to-one -one basis by a political journalist, he really isn't very compelling at all. He blusters, he fluffs, and his armor plating dissolves very quickly. And I'm afraid that's become clearer and clearer as things have developed from the general election through to the fight against the coronavirus. Now, if you were coaching him, and it doesn't sound like he's going to employ you to uh, coach him, so if you don't mind me giving you some advice, don't waste your time on leads that uh, won't come through. Um, what would you, uh, what would you, where would you start? Well, I go back to where we started this interview. Preparation. He doesn't like to prepare before an interview. He doesn't like to rehearse in battle conditions before an interview, and he doesn't like to prepare or rehearse until the last minute before a big speech either. Before party conference, where he was doing a 48 minute speech, he was still writing some of it an hour before he went on stage. And that's fine when you're just creating something that lasts five or six minutes, but not something which lasts nearly an hour and is being watched by two or three million people. The trouble is that he has got to where he has by being able to bluff and bluster under pressure. And it works to a certain point, but beyond that point, it doesn't work. And I'm afraid that's being exposed more and more as his political career continues. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a rest. You can have a drink of water. You can even have a cough sweet, Graham, because I'm gonna ask Ali the physio to give us some uh, physio tips from working at home. Ali, uh, you need to unmute yourself. I've done it. Uh, okay. So normally I nag you all about your posture, but I thought I might have a change today because I've noticed since being back in my clinic that the people who've all been working at home have got a lot in common in that they're all hurting themselves, mainly their legs and their feet. So I've got a group of people with poor posture, posture and bad necks and the other group have got sore feet and knees because they've all been off exercising during lockdown and they've just gone out of the front door, gone for a run or gone for long walks and they've completely forgotten to check what they're wearing on their feet, that's number one, because you need to have good supportive footwear if you're gonna go out for a bit of exercise. And they don't like stretching. Few people like to stretch, but actually if you're gonna do some exercise that you're not used to, you really have to stretch your muscles out, otherwise they're going to tell you the next day that you haven't. And if you keep doing that over a series of days, you're going to end up with plantar fasciitis or an Achilles tendonitis and just these niggles in your legs, which I've been seeing many of. So my big tip for not so much for working at home, it's more for going out and doing the exercise, is just remember, just remember to do a few stretches on your lower legs. It's easy. There's lots on the Internet. You can, it doesn't have to be complicated. It takes five minutes, but it makes a huge difference. And it means that you'll be able to go out and do the exercise the next day without hurting. So there you are. That's my best tip for today. I think you Do mentioned you know. the word exercise and your dog heard it. And, uh, <laughs> you hear it, sorry. <laughs> yeah, she'd like to be going for a walk at the moment. She's being ignored. <laughs> OK, well, don't mention that word walkies in that case. And no. we won't shout that down the... Uh, we won't shout that down the camera. When you say stretching, what do you mean? Though? Do you mean leaning up against the wall and stretching your calves out? I do, yeah. I mean leaning up against the wall and stretching your calf. 
standing up and just putting your leg in front of you and feeling the stretch down the back of your leg. Um, and then just bending your knee up behind, your foot up behind you and stretching the front of your thigh, which gets very tight. So just basic foot and leg stretches, um, which I'm not going to show you because I'm wearing a skirt today. I didn't think about, I didn't think this through, Graham, unfortunately. <laughs> we don't mind, seriously. We don't mind. <laughs> but yeah, so just lower leg stretches, easy to do. Okay, fantastic. Back to you, Graham. Now, You've got rather, you've got some great testimonials on your website and one from uh, Michael Gove. What's that all about? Well, I've known Michael for about 20 years since the time when he used to be a TV journalist and, and feature writer for the Times. So I started coaching him before he went into his political career. He's always been a superbly funny and incisive old style debating type speaker, whether he's talking about a political topic or a completely non-political topic. But when I first coached him, he needed to learn the language and the protocols and just the way that the Conservative Party works, the way that the Conservative Party likes to be communicated with. Because one of the key aspects that people have to remember about politicians in general is that they may have all sorts of character defects that make you want to not like them. But one of the things that they certainly definitely do is work very hard at what they do once they are elected, but they also work incredibly hard to get elected in the first place. And the British Conservative Party has a very rigorous procedure that you have to go through in order, first of all, to become a member of what's known as the candidates list, and then once you're on the candidates list, applying to a particular seat if a seat becomes vacant. The competition is very, very intense. And it was to help him through that competition that I first started coaching Michael Gove. And what tips would you typically give someone in, in, the, in that arena? Because there's, um, there's a lot of people you've got to convince. There, the, the, that's exactly right. Well, as I said, Michael was a, was a brilliant speaker from, from school and from university, but I taught him the specific methods he needed to adapt to the Conservative Party. So, for instance, for the, for the part of the Parliamentary Assessment Board, there's a group exercise where you have to chair a discussion. There's another exercise where you are cross-examined by two or three senior members of the party about your political views. And there's another very exacting exercise where you're suddenly, you're given a topic and then five minutes to prepare a three minute speech. So you might be given a topic and the topic might be, should we apologize for slavery? And then five minutes later, you've got to do a compelling and persuasive three minute speech. And that is something that everybody finds difficult the first few times they do it. So if I'm Michael Gove and I'm going on news night tonight, and I know that slavery is on the front page of every newspaper today. How would you advise me to answer those questions? And for those of you outside the UK, Newsnight is probably the most aggressive television programme on late at night, where the uh, interviewer's job really is to make the politicians squirm. Well, it's interesting. It, by asking that question, you've probably skipped over about 15 years of political development for somebody like Michael Gove, because that exercise I just told you about was just to get on the, the junior rung of the development process, then you have to be able to do, when you apply for a particular seat, there might be 1,200 people who apply for that seat. They'll only interview 10 of you, and they'll select three to go through to a final. And in that final, you have to do a three-minute speech about yourself and your political views, and then subject yourself to 25 minutes of questioning from a professional moderator and from the audience as well. And then the audience vote, and whoever gets the most votes is selected as the candidate. And often, politicians don't get the chance to be interviewed on television for maybe five or six years after they're elected as a member of parliament. So you're unlikely to get that really tough grilling until you're at a particular position in your career, until perhaps you're a junior minister or a cabinet minister. So I'm not avoiding you answering your question, Derek, but he wouldn't have to do anything like that exercise for the purposes of Newsnight. Right. For a, for a political interview, though, 
there are particular types of preparation you need to be able to do. And some of these preparation techniques are, are the same whether you're a politician or a non-politician. Number one, you'll usually know the topic that you're being asked to appear on the television interview for. And you should be able to summarize your views on that topic in one what I call micro statement, which lasts no more than 25 seconds. And you should be able to get that micro statement in at some stage, probably early on during the course of that interview. And indeed, you may have to return to it towards the end once you realize the interview is coming to a close. Then you need to be able to make sure that you've got three or four subsidiary points that support that micro statement that you may or may not choose to use depending on how the questions come up. You may also want to choose three or four subsidiary points beyond those initial supporting points, just in case the interview goes on longer and it goes down a few rabbit holes you weren't expecting. But again, I'll go back to my original piece of advice for just about every set of circumstances. The most important thing that you should do in order to make sure that you are battle ready for that particular interview is to make sure you have a rehearsal with a colleague who's prepared to ask you questions in a, in a way which is as realistic as possible, to grill you as much as possible from as many different unexpected directions as possible. So the actual performance on television isn't as bad as what you've already experienced. And I can see why that's why people use you, Graham, because you need a mentor, a coach, someone you can call up at the, um, at the last minute to go through that. Because I like to think that my rehearsals that I give them are way more unpleasant than anything they'll actually come across on television itself. I bet they, I bet they are. Now, um, I'd like to ask you about the Labour Party leadership. Uh, which came up in December. And just for our friends that wouldn't be aware of this, the uh, uh, Labour Party, the Socialists, uh, re-elected their leader. They got rid of Jeremy Corbyn. But there was a programme uh, run by Andrew Neil, where Andrew Neil interviewed all the candidates. And frankly, they were squirming under, under the seats. Um, Graham, what would you advise to have happened there? It looked like that, uh, you know, it looked crazy. It looked ridiculous. Well, ironically... This is one of the situations where perhaps Boris Johnson's strategy was better than Jeremy Corbyn's strategy. This particular interviewer for the non-Brits who, who are listening, Andrew Neil, is indeed the biggest Rottweiler on British television, a very clever intellectual Rottweiler. And you really need to make sure you are thoroughly prepared and absolutely battle ready before you walk into a studio with him. Jeremy Corbyn, when he went in, I'm afraid has a certain style about him, a certain, a certain pallor about the way that he comes across on television. He has a voice that gets quieter and quieter under pressure. And you can tell when he's struggling because he has an expression on his face that looks as if he's suffering from a very bad attack of indigestion. And the other thing that he tends to do is that instead, when he's asked a very difficult question, like for instance, what is your position on Brexit? Are you a Lever or are you a Remainer? Instead of answering the question head on, what he does is he tends to sidestep it, then go round in a circle, go around all the way up to exactly where he started the answer from, leaving nothing of value in the middle. It's what I call a devil's donut, and it's his main technique when he's being interviewed under pressure. Boris Johnson did the strategic decision of deciding not to be interviewed by Andrew Neil. Admittedly, lots of people accused him of cowardice, but frankly, if he'd done the interview, he could only have lost votes. So actually a tactical withdrawal was probably the best decision by him. And then what, what do you advise people to do when Andrew Neil won't leave it alone? You haven't answered that question, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, will you answer that question, please? Well, my advice is quite un unconventional. I advise people to answer the question head on as much as possible in the first sentence. Even if the answer is an unpleasant, awkward, or one that might cause them a bit of negativity in the short term, 
because people's biggest complaint when they watch political interviews, I think on both British, and I think, I suspect, and I'd be open to correction on this, and on American television as well, is that they hate the way that politicians avoid answering the question. They will forgive them for an answer that they don't like listening to much more quickly than they will forgive them for avoiding the question entirely. So I actually give them techniques on how to answer the question head on in the first sentence, justify it in the next few sentences, and then round it off with their last sentence. And what about if people won't like the answer to the question? You know, there's been too many deaths in the NHS and care homes in this country, and it's a disgrace. Well, that is pain, that's the pain question? that's generated by the answer to that question, a straight answer, will be immediate and ha will have a certain level of intensity. But I believe that by avoiding it, you're going to cause yourself more pain in the long term. OK, and what about the answer? That's not really the question, Mr. Davis. The real question is how much are we invested in the National Health Service over the last 10 years? What about course, that one? If you Everyone... followed my techniques and my advice and you have answered the question head on, it actually takes that weapon away from the interviewer, the weapon of saying you haven't answered the question. My clients always answer them. So you say, yes, there has been 42,000 deaths, um, which is unacceptable. Um, but we're working to do put everything right. Is that is that what you, you, you can use a bridge like that? Yes, you don't avoid the awkwardness of the question. You answer that head on, and then you can pivot to a more positive answer that has more content in it. That's more likely to be received readily and warmly. However, you don't pivot away before you've answered the awkward stuff head on. OK, and how do you put the positive things in? I'm, I, I can't work that out. What you, what you should think of yourself, you should almost think of yourself like a Dalek, which is one of the reasons why I have Daleks behind me. You shoot in one direction, and then you think of yourself pivoting and shoot in the other direction. And make it seem as if you are doing a deliberate move in a particular direction in both the tone of voice and the, and the words that you choose, so that it doesn't seem like an avoidance, it seems like something that you're welcoming. Fantastic. Now I'm gonna to move to Ali the physio for our second tip, and then I'm gonna go, you've got a record number of questions in the chat box, Graham, so we'll fire some of those at you, and then we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll sum up with some of your top tips. So Ali, over to you, what's your second tip for us? Okay, so 25 seconds with my message, was it, Graham? So, Remember to drink plenty of fluid. Drink water, it hydrates your muscles, it gets your brain cells working. If you keep yourself hydrated, you will find that you can concentrate better and you will exercise better. It's very important and it really works. Drink lots and make sure you stay hydrated. Fantastic, right, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Particularly as I'm coming to see you tomorrow and I'm gonna, you're gonna ask me that question. Uh, I will. I but, promise. <laughs> and like a politician, I will try and I will not answer it. Um, uh, so questions in the um, in the chat box. Um, who is Michael Gove, a UK cabinet minister? Somebody's answered that for our American friends. Is he a Boris person appointed or a legislator? He's um, he's elected. Uh, correctly. He's probably, uh, perhaps I can clarify that. He's probably the number three politician in the country, I I equal third. He's ran for he, he ran for the leadership. Um, against Boris Johnson, and he also ran for the leadership against Theresa May, and he finished third both times. Uh, Graham, he does have an image problem, doesn't he? He looks very posh and uh, very, uh, very, a uh, bit like you, really, very posh and very important. <laughs> well, uh, I noticed, um, for instance, looking, uh, I, I bear in mind that Anthony has got a pair of spectacles, and also uh, Michael has got a pair of spectacles that I can see on the screen. And I, I, I say this bearing this in mind. Michael has a problem in that he has possibly the worst eyesight of any sighted person that I know. And his eyesight either gets better or deteriorates depending on the time of day and the lighting conditions. So he has three or four very thick pairs of spectacles that he has to wear depending on what he's doing at any given time. And the problem for him always is that spectacles can be a big barrier in a political TV interview. And for him in particular, he has one of those facial expressions, which uh, uh, there's a, 
there's a there's a possible it, it, there's a phrase called um which i i, I hate to, i hate to use this word because it's 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 slightly sexist it's a brf he has a what's known as a bitchy resting face he can't help but look sad and ticked off with what's going on around him and i can't do an impersonation of it myself but he looks pompous in a way that is unfair because actually he's the most engaging politician that I've ever come across. And he's somebody that actually genuinely listens. But even when he's genuinely listening and being very receptive to the points that are being put against him, he has this face and he needs to continually work on it. And when I'm rehearsing with him, I keep on whispering to him, BRF, 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 to almost force him to just slightly tweak up the corners of his mouth so he doesn't look as if he's got an upside down smile. So that is a barrier that he has to keep continually fighting against. Grace asks, Graham, um, can you tell me more about what you mean by reviewing all the material you may, you may need? Do you mean yes. source material or draft speech? Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I think Grace is referring back to that three point programme that I suggested for preparing a speech. I suppose my challenge in coming out with those three points is that I've written a book on how to do this, which lasts 68,000 words. So I was trying to summarize it in 30 seconds. When you're reviewing the material that you're thinking of using in a speech, you have to ask yourself a really blunt sequence of questions. First of all, you try and splurge out all the written material, all your ideas, all your facts, all your anecdotes, all your numbers perhaps indeed even all the jokes that you're thinking of using and write them all down and then you have to think to yourself looking at that list what in that material that you've got absolutely and definitely fundamentally supports my journey to the finishing position for that particular audience you've got to work out what is the stuff that they must know and what is the stuff that is merely nice to know and the only stuff that you've got time to include in your final speech is the stuff that they must know. You've got to cut out the rest from the material that you're thinking of using. And that clearly takes a lot of time, which is what you've been saying about preparation. And uh, I've read Graham's book and it's fantastic and you can get it on Amazon. So anybody that uh, what likes what Graham does, go out and uh, buy his book. And remember, if you buy it on Amazon, give it a five star rating. Um, Question from Kevin in Chicago. Graham, do you give them short sticking points, headline phrases, memorable quotes? Kennedy's yes. Secretary of Defense advised to never answer the questions asked, rather answer the questions you wished they had asked. That's two questions for you, actually. And indeed, I, I'm a huge admirer of John F. Kennedy, what he did and the way that he spoke during his political career. But I'm sorry to sound terribly cynical about it, in 2020 the advice he was given is now 58 years old and i believe that that don't answer the question just answer the questions you'd like to be answered i'm afraid because audiences are so heavily exposed to tv and social media all the time they're very wise to that avoidance technique very quickly and i don't think avoidance like that is something that really serves a politician well these days I also don't actually like the use of, of memorable quotes because I do believe that people actually want your opinions, not the opinions of Oscar Wilde or George Bernard Shaw or, or Franklin Roosevelt. They want your opinions in that three or four minutes that you're on a TV interview. So I actually think that although some of those pieces of advice you were mentioning, Kevin, were very useful a long time ago, I think we've moved on since then. Kevin's next question is about the sweating factor. And I thought I'd refer to our uh, conversation yesterday uh, when you told me about Studio Mac powder and particularly for you, Graham, with your complexion number six. Um, <laughs> does that avoid the sweating factor? Well, um, I was being coached by another coach 12 years ago for um, my first few TV interviews that I was doing on Sky. And I bear in mind that with Tim and Will, I have two people who have very similar um, hairdressers that, to, to the one that I use. 
and of course, I <laughs> thank you, Will. Thank you for that gesture of support. Um, I, my, the coach said to me, now, Graham, I don't know whether you've spotted it, but you are losing your hair just a little bit. And I said, well, thank you very much indeed for pointing it out so tactfully. And he said, what you need is to use something, because obviously, Graham, sometimes you're going into studios like Sky, who spend half an hour putting lovely makeup on you uh, by, by pretty ladies, and they, they airbrush your face as well, and they massage your shoulders to relax you. But if it's NBC or CNN or sometimes even the BBC, you're lucky if you get somebody just to put, to put a powder puff on your face. So you need to make sure that you take control of that situation. What you need is to use some Studio Mac powder on your nose, on your cheeks, and especially on your head, just in case there isn't any makeup, um, any makeup department professionally available. So I went along to the Studio Max store in Liverpool with my then girlfriend and went up to one of these ladies who were wearing quite a lot of makeup herself. So that was a hopeful sign. And I said to her, um, hello, good evening. I would like to buy a container of Studio Mac powder, please, young lady. And she said to me, certainly, sir. What number are you? And I looked at my feet and said, oh, I'm a size 10. And she said, no, no, no. What number on the... Studio Max Spectrum, are you? And I said, I have no idea whatsoever. And then she looked at me on this and, and compared my face to this card in front of her. And it turns out, as Derek said, I'm a number six. And she presented me with a black plastic container and said, there you are, sir. And of course, I looked slightly perplexed. And she said to me, have you any idea how to use this, sir? And I said, no, none whatsoever. And she sat me down and got a brush in front of a mirror and dabbed me around here and around here. And I've got to say, I looked pretty good afterwards. I was, you know, 20% less shiny, 30% better looking, and 40% more confident. It was really pretty good. And I was smugly looking at myself in the mirror. And she looked at me and said, do you mind me asking um, what it's for? And I rather arrogantly said, well, <laughs> TV. And she said, oh yeah, of course. We get loads of transvestites in here. <laughs> and I said, no, no, please, there's, there's, there's a mistake. I'm sorry, you don't understand. And my girlfriend, by the way, was just nodding like this, giving me no, no support whatsoever. And I said, no, you, you don't decide. I do some, I do some um, um, work as a, on a, as, as a TV interviewee. And she said, don't worry, love. Your secret's safe with us. Brilliant, brilliant. Can we go back to the sweating thing, though? Because sometimes... Um, sometimes oh, forgive me, you're absolutely right. Sorry, I, 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 I sidestepped that. I, I did a devil's donut in relation to sweating. No, the that, way that was of avoiding answer. those little beads of sweat is indeed to use some powder. Studio but, Mac is a, is a brand that I recommend more highly than anyone else. You're a Chanel man, aren't you, Will? He's, he's muted, luckily, uh, Graham, so we'll keep it that way for a little while. We'll let him loose later, but... Uh, um, what about, so professional speaker, doesn't put the makeup on, goes on stage, introduced by Graham Davis, big build up, lights come on, and you get a bit of this here, which I think's Kevin's thing. You know, now you're hoping no one notices this, you're under a bit of pressure. Do you, do you do that or do that, or do you just hope for the best? Well, I have to say, because of that problem, because, because I am a slaphead, I, I do indeed sweat when I'm excited, not because I'm nervous, but because. I put an awful lot of energy into any speaking engagement. And if I'm not working hard enough so that I sweat, I'm not working hard enough full stop. So that is a problem. And I know exactly what you mean. That there's an almost like a, there's a trickling effect. And especially when you're wearing, um, no, not necessarily wearing a Love Allier mic, because that might be to the side, but if you're holding a handheld stick mic, there is this danger that drops of sweat will drop into the microphone. And I'm always terrified that you might actually electrocute yourself. I think you do have to have a pretty thick handkerchief stuffed into your trousers just in case and have a quick wipe. Otherwise, you may not make it to the end of the speech. <laughs> okay, brilliant, brilliant. Right, back to the questions, Graham. Uh, yeah. Elvira says, she's noticed politicians will repeat the same answer but in different words to tricky questions. Is that something you would recommend? I guess the answer is no, but I'll let you answer that. I wouldn't recommend it. But on the other hand, though, sometimes if the interviewer is being particularly persistent, the interviewer themselves is asking the same question in slightly different ways. 
And so it becomes a little bit of a dance between interviewer and interviewee. I wouldn't suggest it as a proactive technique that an interviewee should start doing unless the interviewer is essentially hammering away at the same topic from different directions. Okay, what about contact lenses? Someone says, shouldn't, uh, you know, if you have a glasses issue, should you wear contact lenses? I heard that salespeople were told to wear uh, contact lenses that worked for one particular sales company in the 80s. They weren't allowed to wear glasses at all. Well, uh, let's go back to Michael Gove, and I'm not betraying a confidence when I say this. He, he's tried contact lenses. Trouble is, he's got the sort of metabolism that when, when he's under pressure and he's doing a speech or he's being interviewed in front of TV lights, his eyeballs swell slightly, and so suddenly contact lenses become a source of agony. So they don't necessarily work. Fantastic. Um, okay, just uh, reading a few more before we go. I'd like to go to Trump before we finish, if, if you'll let me. Yes, by all means. Um, in fact, the question is about Trump. Trump had oh. an outside interview on a very hot day yesterday and had the Nixon sweat. I don't know what the Nixon sweat is, but I could guess. What's well, the Nixon sweat refers, of course, to the 1960 presidential debate between Kennedy and Nixon. It was the first time there'd been a head-to-head -head debate between the two leading political candidates on television in any country. And, of course, that was the first time that we saw the power of appearance plus words as opposed to words on its own, as people would have heard on the radio debates. And Kennedy, of course... Was the, had professional makeup, and he indeed looked good no matter what was happening. Nixon didn't have professional makeup and didn't shave for the second time before the debate, which was late afternoon where he was doing it. And unfortunately, the sweat and the five o'clock shadow were significant factors in certain elements of the audience liking Kennedy more than him. Now, um, you do have to make sure you know your own metabolism quite well. And so, for instance, today, I, I, I won't turn the camera around to show you my living room, but I've made sure that I've got two windows that are absolutely wide open to make sure I've got some reasonable cool air coming through to minimise the sweat that, I, that I'm likely to feel. I deliberately chose, Derek, a, a dark shirt rather than a light shirt to make sure absolutely that no matter what pressure you were going to put me under today, I wasn't going to show the damp armpit look that sometimes makes politicians look so bad. You've got to know your own metabolism, have a support team around you if you are a politician, uh, make sure that you wear the right makeup for you, even if it's only a mattifier to take away the sheen. And it actually, when you're under pressure, you, I would suggest that you really do need to wear a jacket over your shirt to make sure there's absolutely no chance of sweat showing through. That happened to Tony Blair, didn't he, in that uh, Iraqi war interview by 24 ladies on ITV, and he was sweating under here in a blue shirt, a light yes, blue shirt, and, uh, and then he was towed down, obviously, in the adverts or something. I was surprised someone as skilled as Tony Blair, that happened to him. Well, I think he was the first person that, that it actually happened to on television, and unfortunately, it really was a very light shirt indeed. That's why I would recommend, whether you're on television or whether you're doing a speech in almost any circumstances, Unlike today, where I thought I would be a bit racy and just wear a dark shirt without a jacket, if you're a lady or if, if you it's if a lady is wearing a blouse, I would absolutely definitely recommend that she wears a jacket on top. But men absolutely should wear a jacket on top, no matter what the circumstances. I would suggest. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, right, turning to Trump. What so what are you going to tell us about? What can you tell us about your observations on uh, Donald Trump? Now, I'm, I'm deliberately only talking from a presentational point of view and not, not making any, any political comments whatsoever about him. But he, he is an interesting presentational phenomenon. The main thing that I notice is the tone that he adopts. What he has is a very unusual downward going tone all the time. Most politicians, especially in election season, have an upward going tone. They try to make sure that the way their words sound goes upwards and therefore subliminally offers hope, inclusion, and vision. 
And that's the way that they try to appeal to as wide a group of listeners and viewers as possible. Donald Trump's technique isn't necessarily designed to try and include a lot of people that go beyond his base. His downward going style tends to energize the people just that already agree with his particular point of view. He's not someone who provides hope and vision and unity necessarily, but he appeals to people's fears very, very effectively. And it's that downward style that he has that does that very, very effectively. Now, the other thing about him is that I'm not quite sure why this is the case, because sometimes he does manage to stick to a script very, very occasionally. But a lot of the time, and I would say most of the time, he doesn't. And his advisors have given up trying to tell him to stick to his script. He much prefers to be able to free wheel. And again, that appeals to his supporter base because they quite like the unstructured nature of what he says. They would say that this is an example of him being authentic. That's the real Donald, not, what, not a Donald that's being engineered and manufactured by professional advisors. But it does mean that there's one particular presentational test, which in my opinion, as a presentation coach, not as a political advisor, that a test that Donald Trump's speeches fail. Most uplifting political electoral persuasion speeches will pass the test of making sense when you listen to them, and also they'll make sense when you read the transcript afterwards. Donald Trump's have a certain emotional sense when you hear them for the first time, especially if you happen to be in his camp already. But when you read the verbatim transcripts of them, the way that he repeats himself, the way that he goes off on tangents, and the way that he uses sentences that sometimes last five or 10 minutes without a break, they don't make sense at all afterwards when they're on the written page. And that is why I think that his speeches will never be remembered particularly positively by history. They may be effective for a short period of time, but they don't have any real longevity. Finally, I would say this, you should probably look at politicians in any country, not just as speakers, not just as interviewees, not just as presenters. You should look at them as persuaders. And you have to think to yourself, does this speech persuade the audience that it's aimed at? At the other end of the scale, someone like Boris Johnson is incredibly persuasive and charming when he's speaking to three or four people at a time. He becomes less and less persuasive as he's speaking to larger audiences and also when he's actually on national television. You have to look at Donald Trump's technique and think, is he persuading his, his base, the 35 to 40% that, that really love Donald Trump no matter what, is he persuading his, his base to go out and vote for him? Yes, I believe he is. But is he persuading the five or 10% more that he needs in order to be reelected again to vote for him? I think his current style on this particular occasion for the second time around when we know what to expect with him, I don't think he's going to be persuasive enough for that five or 10% gains that he needs. Fantastic, Graham. Now uh, we're coming to the end of the interview. I'm gonna uh, turn the recording off in a minute. And uh, if you'd stay with us, that would be fantastic and answer uh, any questions that people don't want to put on the recording. But one last tip for any of us presenting from, uh, from you, for, out of your book, uh, The Presentation Coach. I think the, 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 the biggest tip I can give you is the concept of the micro message. A micro message is a sequence of words which quickly and compellingly captures the essence of your company, your product, or your key idea. It's what you would say if you only had 10 seconds in which to do the entire speech or presentation or interview. If you can encapsulate your core concept in one diamond sharp sentence, you've got a really good chance of a diamond sharp speech.
Fantastic, Graham. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, thanks today for from Ali the physio. Give us a wave, as it, Ali, um, as you uh, as you start your work, Graham. That was absolutely enthralling. Will you come back and join us again in a few months' time? I'd be delighted to, especially perhaps when the president of the United States proves me completely wrong and wins a landslide. Absolutely, absolutely, Graham. Thank you very much indeed.